also from the animal side. Um, so actually in Imagic we put a lot of efforts on the investigation of the this fluoride out of boric ox oxyborid electrolyte. And today I'm gonna present our work on the interfaces and interfaces in magnesium batteries with this non-crossing electrolyte. So just a little bit background. So um, when we talk about magnesium batteries, obviously the use of magnesium metal offers a lot of advantages, including this high capacity and very low redox potential, but also like the uh, uh, earth abundance and um, the sustainability, which makes it attractive for large scale applications, especially. Um, so we see magnesium metal anode as the main driving force for the development of magnesium batteries. And uh, actually with these properties, we are able to at least expect um, the uh, um, energy density up to 750 watt hour per liter and gravimetric wise close to 300 watt hour per kilogram cell level. Um, of course, this um, estimation is based on the assumption that we have a well-performed castle that delivers a capacity of 165 kg per gram at 3.1 grams of magnesium. Uh, but on the other hand, um, if we want to cycle the cell at the full capacity, we also need uh, a reversible magnesium anode. This is also um, mentioned by uh, Doron in this talk. So here I give you a, a graph here. Uh, this is basically how the capacity retention develops over cycle at different magnesium plate extreme efficiencies. So we see clearly that with the, uh, the red points, we have 99% of CE, and uh, if we want to uh, get a full capacity, then we are only able to size the cell uh, for less than 100 times. However, if we are able to um, increase the chromatic uh, efficiency up to 99.9%, we were able to extend the cycle life up to more than 700 cycles. So, the highly reversible magnesium plate stripping is important, especially when we consider, consider a blunt uh, lifespan of the cell. So the uh, plate stripping process of magnesium is actually mainly governed by this electrolyte, which is in direct contact with magnesium anode. Um, so, if we look at the development of magnesium electrolyte, we see that it's not straightforward, we have a lot of struggles. And this is because we are dealing with this monovalent, actually divalent magnesium ions, which interact strongly with the counter anions. So, in a lot of magnesium compounds, we see these ion pairs, which is much more uh, prominent than in a monovalent system. And uh, this will normally lead to very limited solubility in non aqueous solutions, and therefore we have insufficient high mobility that support our um, uh, anode and also the cathode redox reactions. Um, so this situation has changed um, when we uh, have this uh, chloride-based electrolyte developed. This is already mentioned a lot by Darwin. So this is, um, uh, there are a couple of uh, chloride-based electrolytes, for example, the APC electrolyte, and also some other magnesium compound with the addition of either magnesium chloride or aluminum chloride. So with this chloride species, um, we are able to have better cation anion dissociation. So basically the interaction between the magnesium ion and the chloride is stronger than magnesium with the original anise. Uh, however, we should also realize that here we are dealing with the uh, um, solution environment. That means we really need um, a large amount of chloride species. So this will, of course, lead to the project issue. Um, so uh, in search for the um, chloride-free or let's say crossing 
less processed electrolyte. We have one strategy that has been demonstrated successful, and this is to uh, introduce the uh, so-called weakly coordinated anions. Um, as shown here, uh, in this concept, we are having the anion that interacts weaker than the uh, magnesium solvent interaction. And um, uh, this leads to the development of the magnesium covering electrolyte, which has shown very nice uh, chlorophyll efficiency, as already demonstrated on the first day uh, by the Toyota Center. And also, we have this uh, magnesium borrowed electrolyte that I'm going to talk about today. So, in addition to this solution environment, actually the interface is also playing a, a crucial role here, especially if you consider the charge transfer and ion transfer at the interface. Um, so, normally magnesium suffers from passivation because it's quite reactive. Um, and what we can think about is to um, at least try to develop an electrolyte that makes uh, interface free um, surface. And therefore, a um, lot of electrolyte that has high resistance to reduction has been developed, but this also means, in general, um, low resistance to oxidation. And on the other hand, if we consider a metal anode, and we run the metal anode for a couple of hundred or even thousand cycles um, without interface, um, then we also require a high purity of the electrolyte. So, because any um, impurities or byproduct that could somehow um, pass it the, the metal anode. Um, fortunately, we have a chloride which um, shows ability to. Uh, break the passivating layer, so maybe the inorganic components, so that we have the quality of uh, SDI um, free uh, anode surface. But we, uh, since we are working mainly on the current free electrolyte system, we will also think in what will be the scenario if there's no chloride. Um, then of course, the first thing that came to my mind, or to our mind, is actually we, we still have the interface, but it allows the um, uh, mobility of magnesium ions. So, um, actually, in the beginning of the Imagic project, we um, have developed this um, magnesium um, hexafluoroisopropyl oxyborid electrolyte. And uh, we see that uh, this electrolyte shows uh, very good electrolytic performance, so high oxidative stability, long term cycling, and efficient flavor is um, Then we, we ask ourselves what is really happening. So, uh, basically, what enables this um, long term cycling of magnesium anode, and what is the interfacial phenomenon? Do we really have a uh, stable? Or let's say, do we have an interface, or it's still like a SDF3 or quasi SDF3? Um, so, with these questions, we uh, start to look at the interface, interface a magnesium anode. And, um, and actually, we try to mimic uh, a more or less practical cell condition. So, we uh, use the magnesium anode in a full cell condition. And uh, here we use uh, titanium sulfide as the model castle, and this is how the the cell uh, charge and discharge. So we see that after the first cycle, we get a relatively stable uh, cycling. And what we do is we stop the cell at 20 cycles and take out the magnesium foil, and we do um, a cross-sectional image. And here, the, this SEM image shows. Um, like basically the lower part is the magnesium and the upper part we have covered some platinum to uh, protect the, the interface. So what we observe here is um, some interface layer uh, with roughly 20 nanometer and we were wondering if this is really like uh, some uh, SDI or interface on the magnesium foil. 
Um, however, at that time, um, the SEM has reached its SM, uh, resolution limit, so we are not able to go further in that direction. Uh, but instead, we use some spectroscopy analysis to study what is going on on the magnesium surface. So basically, we, we take a look at IR, and uh, here you see the uh, upper spectrum is the uh, is the electrolyte, and the lower spectrum is the magnesium anode after some So we see some changes actually. Uh, so first of all, we see the formation of uh, new peaks related to magnesium fluoride spectrum. So this may indicate the formation of magnesium fluoride, and we also see like um, the um, the vibrations related to CF is shifted, and um, this might suggest we have a certain decomposition of the, the anise, so that the, the CF vibration has shifted. Um, then we um, further like confirm these findings with XPS because basically it's more um, surface sensitive. Um, so what we found is also like we, we have identified this magnesium fluoride and CF species, but in addition we also find some small number of boron. So basically, um, what we have here is like uh, the magnesium fluoride, CF, and boron uh, compounds. So if we look at the source of this decompos uh, this uh, decomposition product, mainly they are from the animals. Um, then um, we approach to our um, project partners from DPU, they did, the, did a lot of the theoretic studies on this uh, electrolyte. So what we, we found from the theoretic uh, calculation is that the, uh, the anion itself, so here it's basically the free, uh, free anions, uh, they are actually thermodynamic stable. Um, down to uh, minus two volt versus magnesium, so we are more or less sure that we are not decomposing the free anions. Um, however, we also found the ion pairing. If there is formation of magnesium anion plus, um, then the decomposition could happen at very early. So basically, could even be for magnesium palladium. So we believe that the decomposition is mainly due to the ion pairing in the uh, solution. Then we take a step further to the mechanism. Um, basically, we consider a, a reductive envi environment. So already, like magnesium um, has one uh, electron, and we consider like the, the breaking of the boron oxygen bond and carbon oxygen bond and the CF bond. Uh, from the free energy. We see that the, the last uh, uh, mechanism is uh, more energetically more favorable. Uh, and also, like the second one, it could also be happened during the plating because we normally have some uh, over potentials. Um, since this ion pairs is, is very crucial, so we also take a look at ion pairs in our solution. Um, Maybe if we first take a look at the, the uh, EME-based electrolyte. Um, so our starting point is actually we have the uh, um, magnesium which is fully solvated by uh, the solvent. So six oxygen ore from the solvent. Then we slowly, like stepwise, um, substitute the oxygen by the anion. So first fluoride and then the anion oxygen. So what we observe is that um, we need to overcome a fairly high energy barrier if we uh, want to have interaction between cation and anions. And this is true not only for DME, but also for some other blind-based solvents. Uh, so the solvation is um, energetically favorable than ion pairs, and this is also uh, an indication that we have large degree of dissociation as we um, uh, uh, as a concept of this approach. Um, then um, another thing we found is like the inter the ion pairs is 
possible if we are slowly increasing the uh, concentration. So we are able to move uh, from a fully solvent <laughs> magnesium to a certain degree of iron cadmium, but only through magnesium fluoride reaction. Um, however, if there is any magnesium uh, oxygen, so this oxygen from anion interaction, this will lead to some spontaneous uh, process, so like further coordination with more um, coordinated sites from the anion. So this will lead to a large aggregation of the uh, magnesium compound in solution, and this means also like um, it's, it's basically an oversaturated solution. So uh, we see that in almost uh, in the solubility range, we are more, most probably having this uh, only small um, amount of high pairings through magnesium fluoride interaction. And we also compare with different solvent, basically. And what we see, especially from the first step, first substitution, um, G2 gives the lowest energy. So we could expect more ion pairs in the G2 based electrolyte. Um, then we, think, we, we consider this different coordination environment and um, have um, studied both theoretic, so basically calculate the IR spectrum and try to um, uh, compare the calculate spectrum with our experiment spectrum. So here I only show this um, the theoretic spectrum, and we are focusing on the CF vibrations. And um, basically, um, these uh, green lines indicates like uh, minor aggregation, so magnesium fluoride interaction. And we see this only very uh, small shift in this range. But once we have the major aggregation through magnesium oxygen interaction, the profile has changed completely. Then we start our experiment. Basically, we, we prepare magnesium borate electrolyte uh, in different solvent and also uh, with different concentration up to the solubility limit, so 0.5.6 molar. And um, this is how this uh, experiment data looks like. So what we can see um, in different uh, uh, electrolyte is that there's only minor shift of this peaks in this region and is uh, more or less similar to the uh, the scenario or this coordination where magnesium fluoride is has some interaction. So we we have experimentally uh, demonstrated that there's only minor aggregation. Uh, even at the concentration limit, so 4.5.6, we cannot reach this magnesium oxygen uh, interaction uh, in the solution. Then um, we also take a look at the, the, the interfaces. So we uh, check how the uh, decomposition product is at different uh, electrolyte. So we recycle the uh, magnesium, so basically here is magnesium, magnesium symmetric cell in different solvent. Um, also we cycle with different concentrations and then we take out the, the anode and do XPS. And here we focus on the magnesium spectrum. Um, the, um, we, we see the content of magnesium 2 plus species as indicator of electrolyte decomposition. Um, so basically, uh, we have changed the, uh, the concentration and also changed the solvent. Uh, and the content of magnesium 2 plus species, um, we not only take a look at the interface, uh, not uh, at the most surface, but also a bit into depth, because we, we want to uh, eliminate the, the impact from whatever remaining on the uh, very surface for example, the, the electrolyte solvent, whatever. Um, so what we see here is, like with G2-based electrolyte, we get higher uh, magnesium 2 plus content. Um, this indicates um, more electrolyte decomposition as 
um, we learn from the theoretical uh, spectacular vision. But um, by changing the, uh, the concentration, uh, we didn't see obvious cha uh, changes in terms of the magnesium 2 plus uh, content. So um, we see that um, if, if we want to really uh, change the ion pairs, and um, if we uh, play with the solvent is uh, a more promising way than just changing the concentration. So, so far for this um, the interfaces, and now I will move a little bit to this interface. So, um, as Doro already mentioned, actually we also observed that this activation process in our first applications, um, and we believe this is also like um, the, the, the large over potential uh, initially. So we also see this phenomenon in our semantic cell. So once we, we, uh, we start cycling our cell up to OCV, we see a very deep uh, drop of the voltage. And um, this is also true if we, after some cycling, we restart the cell again, we still see like um, uh, the voltage deep. Um, so basically, this is. Um, um, so we, we take a look at impedance and try to find out what is the reason. Um, uh, we see like increase of the impedance um, if we um, increase our resting time, and um, also um, once we uh, we cycle the cell, the impedance drops sharply. So um, with this sharp um, drop of the voltage and the impedance data, we, we see it, it, it's not likely that the, the interface, like the solid uh, interface, is playing a role here because this change is quite fast. We don't see this like a very rapid formation of this layer, but rather some uh, absorption layer. So we want to um, regulate this interface, basically the, uh, the, uh, the absorption layer uh, by using some electrolyte additives. So uh, here we use magnesium borohydride, basically because um, we still want to, to stay in a chlorine free scenario and uh, also the borohydride gives a strong connection uh, with magnesium. So um, what we do is we just put very small amount of magnesium borohydride borohydride into our um, electrolyte. So uh, the bulk electrolyte contains the point three molar magnesium borate, and um, then we see the improvements. So in the first cycle for plenty, um, we see like a large increase of power response, and this also. Um, there's also like improvement in terms of thermal efficiency, so we get a very stable chromatic efficiency uh, immediately after like one cycle or so. Um, this also leads to like a reduce of the, the overpotential um, in the symmetric cell. Um, we also tested uh, uh, in the uh, so. Uh, the, check, the switch from a static to dynamic condition, so stop the cell in between and we uh, restart it at certain points. So we see um, all the other potentials if we have the additive has decreased. So uh, then we also um, uh, check the impedance with electrolyte contain, uh, additive contained electrolyte. And uh, in order to compare with our pure electrolyte, um, we use uh, this um, uh, equivalent circuit. So basically, we consider an interface, a soft layer, and an electrolyte. So these three parts, and this R3 interface. Um, so basically, we use the same circuit for the, uh, the end before cycling and after cycling. It's just the interface was negative oxide layer in case of the OCD, but um, maybe the SDI upon cycling. So what we get is like this. So uh, basically the, 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 the blue uh, uh, 
uh, dots, they are, um, uh, they are true values, so the absorption layer and the red ones are the, uh, the interface, so the R3 value. So we see that we, we, there's not much change of the R2 values, but a sharp decrease um, uh, of this R3 values. So um, this might indicate that we have some uh, preferential adsorption on the magnesium surface that um, decrease the charge transfer resistance there. Um, then also upon cycling, we see that the, the R3 values drop quicker, so we have uh, R3 value um, uh, more or less stable after the first one or two cycles. So this might indicate that we have uh, faster formation of SDI. Then at last, we also take a look at this um, uh, XPS data of the magnesium adult. And uh, we also uh, focus on the magnesium spectrum, uh, basically to, to see the magnesium 2 plus to magnesium 0 ratio. Um, the upper one is the active contained electrolyte, while the bottom one is the pure electrolyte. So we see like an increase of the magnesium 2 plus to magnesium 0 ratio, but also like the content of fluorine and boron has increased. Uh, to some extent after cycling. So we, we believe that the magnesium borohydride could um, have um, preferential absorption on magnesium surface and also promote the formation of the interfaces. So uh, to summarize, um, uh, we, we see that uh, magnesium boron electrolyte shows different anode interface phenomenon. Um, if we compare to the chloride-based electrolyte, and we have identified the, an interface which contains magnesium 2 plus with magnesium chloride, basically, and also some uh, CF species and a little bit of boron. Um, so we see magnesium 2, 2 plus species as an indicator, uh, but here this graph shows. Um, like, uh, if you look at here, the magnesium fluoride, the, the blue bars, it has a much lower energy barrier, uh, diffusion energy barrier than the magnesium oxide. Uh, so we believe that maybe um, the magnesium fluoride, um, of course, if it's in a bulk, we don't have a chance to, to get a, a fast diffusion, but if we have a small content of magnesium chloride together with some other uh, organic species plus some boron, for example, then we have a chance to get, to get a stable uh, SDI. Um, the good thing is uh, we have an electrolyte system that shows large degree of anion cation uh, dissociation so that we can uh, modify the ion pair and to induce the uh, SDI formation to, uh, to some extent by changing the, for example, the solvent and additive. And um, we, we hope that um, by further optimization, we were able to get a, a better um, SDI and also better um, a chromic efficiency for magnesium back resistance. So at last, I want to, uh, of course, thank the image for funding this, but also we have um, other uh, funding resources that support the work and that makes our work and our collaboration possible. And finally, I thank you for your attention.